Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the Lead X Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. How can you generate fierce loyalty on your team? Hello, everyone. Kevin Cruz here, helping you to get 1% better each and every day. Today, we're going to learn about full Monty leadership. But first, I want to encourage you to visit leadx.org and sign up for our 60-second newsletter. Each issue has actionable tips you can try right away to improve your productivity and advance your career. Visit leadx.org. Now, our guest today is the founder of Full Monty Leadership. He travels around the world as an executive coach and keynote speaker. In fact, he's been named as a top 100 leadership speaker by Inc. Magazine. He's also the host of the Leadership and Loyalty podcast and the author of the best-selling book, Fiercely Loyal. Our guest today is also my good friend, Dov Barron. Dov, how you doing? Good, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to add value. Oh, I know you're going to add a lot of value bombs on this episode. I'm looking forward to it. So we like to start out actually with our lightning round. I know a lot of others will tack on questions at the end. I like to start out high energy, lots of value. The first question is just what advice would you give to a young professional who's eager to get ahead in her career? So that is actually a really great question. Simplicity of it is if you really want to get ahead, the first thing you have to do is know your purpose. Know what it is that matters most to you. If you, you otherwise, you end up pursuing a career that's not really calling to your soul. I know people are scared of that word, but that a part of you that is the pureness, the authenticity of you. So, so once you're aligned with that, you do move at a super speed. That's what makes you travel faster. Brilliant. Now, you work with leaders around the world. Uh, you've been doing this for, for decades. What is a common leadership mistake or leadership weakness that you see out there? Uh, it's actually addressed to the same thing I just spoke about, is that very often I find that leaders are looking at who they think they should be as opposed to who they are. They think that leadership is a thing, meaning, okay, if I'm going to be a leader, I have to wear this suit, this tie, this outfit, and along with that, this attitude and this, all those things that are not statements about who they are. The biggest mistake in leading is to try to be something that you're not because that doesn't endear people to you. It actually pushes them away. Can't fake it. You got to be yourself. Yeah. And, and so people ask me a question like, uh, well, how to be more authentic? Right there, we have the problem. Authenticity <laughs> is you. So how do you be more of you? Well, you stop trying to be who you're not. There's the answer. You got to take stuff away. You don't need to add to it. Exactly. That's the key is remove, not add. Now, this changes it up a little bit. But, Dov, I've, in a lot of the high achievers I speak to, they seem to have uh, sort of specific morning routines, a similar set of rituals each morning. So I'm just curious, what's your typical morning look like? My morning starts very early. It's usually around five when I wake I drink a drink that is a uh, removes inflammation, which is disgusting, but I drink it every morning. It's apple cider vinegar. It is cayenne pepper. It is turmeric and, and Himalayan salt and water. Horrible stuff, but it actually removes the inflammation from, from your body, but it allows the brain to work better. That's part of the thing for me. Then it's a meditation. Then it's uh, coffee with a lot of oil in it. Because I'm uh, ketogenic, I eat more, more healthy fats. Um, then usually after that, it's my workout. Uh, then I come back from the workout, shower, clean up, and all the rest of it. Um, then there's usually a five or ten minute meditation again. And then usually I'll begin to write. And then from there, then I start work. Brilliant. Brilliant. I love that routine. I think I'd, uh, I like that anti-inflammation solution, but I'll wait for it in pill form. <laughs> can't say I'm blaming you <laughs> <laughs> all right so Dov your book is called Fiercely Loyal and you say that you know keeping top millennial talent is the most important thing leaders can do so tell me more about that why is retention and loyalty so important why should that be a top priority well as you know I mean this is your subject to which is engagement I mean engagement is incredibly poor it's incredibly low and and 
it seems to be more than ever. I don't know that that's true or if we're just more aware of it than we were before. But engagement is very low. So if you don't, here's the simplicity of it. If you don't keep your people, there's no ROI. So one of the things that I speak about from the platform, one of the things I'm brought in to speak about it is this very subject. And it's, it's this, understand this. When I entered the workforce, I'm in my late 50s. When I entered the workforce, I was asked the question, what do you want to do for a career? It was a 20 to 40 year question. So many people in top le leadership positions are around my age, they're 50 plus, and they were asked the same question. And the difficulty that they, they struggle with is, well, these millennials seem very entitled and they disappear. Well, here's the deal. When you ask them what you want to do for the rest of your life, they don't know because career to them is a four year, not a 40 year. It's 10 times less. That's a career, not a job. A job is every 1.2 to two years. And here's the thing that they, you need to know as a leader, get this. It, it costs you 1.5 to two times the annual salary of every individual to train and develop them. Therefore, if you don't if you don't keep them longer than two years, you have no ROI. They are a cost to you. So if you don't keep them, if you don't know how to build that loyalty, you are already running at a deficit. Your bottom line is people. I had never even thought about that before, where if, if your retention rate gets bad enough, it can drive you out of business. And, and the turnover issue, I usually think of as in multiple careers to life. It's actually, or multiple jobs. You're saying it's actually multiple careers. Millennials yeah. will have multiple careers now. Well, if you've got 1.2 to two years in a job and you've got four years in a career, so I can have two jobs in every career. So, you know, you're not thinking about that. So one of the things we teach um, high level organizations to do when we're talking to a fortune, whatever group it is, we say, here's the thing. You want to keep millennials? Don't allow them to get bored. They love to learn. And so when you employ one, and I learned this totally by experience, not because I was brilliant, but because I hired a guy. We were very small. We hired a guy, a millennial, a young millennial. He had just graduated with an HR degree, right? And I said, I don't need an HR person. I had advertised for an ass administrative assistant. He goes, I've looked at your stuff. I want to work with you. And I'm like, Okay, mate, but we don't have HR. He goes, no. And I said, okay. I, I liked his attitude. So I'll tell you what. I'll take you on, but the deal is because we're small, you will have to wear multiple hats. Right. I kept him for five years. Wow. So beyond a career. And I kept him in this simple way. I kept throwing new stuff at him. Okay. Do you know anything about websites? No. And I said, do you want to do it? Yeah. He went and learned code. He learned how to build my sites. Do you know anything about video? No taught him how to frame, taught him how to do the imagery, how, how to make it look right. He went away, studied all the, all the software, came back, did it. He ended up doing all those things for me and a whole bunch more. And in the process, and this is an important thing for leaders to understand, in the process, I said to him this, you are going to leave me. He was like a year in. I said, you're going to leave me. I already understood the psychology. And he goes, well, why do you say that? I love working here. I said, it's just because that's the nature of it. It's what's going to happen. I said, but here's what I want you to know. When you're ready to leave, don't sneak away. I want you to come and tell me because I'm going to be your best customer. And he's like, what? I go, I'm going to support you. Because whatever you open as a business, there's a good chance I trained you in it or I paid for you to learn it. And he went, okay. When he left us at five years, he opened a company and we were his first customer. Amazing insight you had into that and, and, and you know, th that prediction and what a great way, what a great attitude about it, uh, it to preserve the relationship and just to be a, a great, <laughs> a good human being. I mean, I've had bosses where I left, I, you know, to do my own thing and did everything above board, you know, wasn't stealing employees or clients or anything else. And still the bitterness was just crazy, but I don't want to go down uh, that, that rabbit but, hole. But understanding this, the, you know, you, this is one of the things I want leaders to grasp from this. We don't live in the same world anymore. When I, when I started out, you know, I had my first business when I was 15, but, but my first brick and mortar business wasn't until I was 20. If you wanted to start a brick and mortar business, you had to have a lot of money, you had a lot of support, a lot of backing. You know what? I can start a business today online for 10 bucks. That's it. 10 bucks. It doesn't cost me. It's very easy to do, particularly if I'm a pretty resourceful young man or a young woman. I can do that. So grasping that we don't 
We don't live in the same world. This is a time of entrepreneurship, and we live in the most entrepreneurial country in the world in the U.S. So it's a time of entrepreneurship in an entrepreneurial environment where the rest of the world is becoming entrepreneurial as well. If you think that you're their best option, you are smoking crack. Yep. Stop now, immediately, because you live in an entrepreneurial world. Therefore, your employees need to be encouraged into that. So you need to build entrepreneurial processes where they can think like an entrepreneur inside your environment. They will build your business for you. And that way you're not restricting them. They have autonomy. They have all the things that they want and they add a ton of value to you. Don, that is very, uh, I'm blown away and it's, and it's inspiring. I think not only are you going to train a lot of leaders with what you just said, I think we're going to have about a hundred listeners that are going to resign today and start their own businesses as well. <laughs> <laughs> Put 10 bucks. <laughs> That's right. So, okay. Now, one of the, one of the chapters in your book is uh, about the hero's journey. And yes. now I'm a hero's journey junkie. Like I love storytelling. I read all the storytelling craft books for, for fiction and Hollywood movies. Uh, it's an important, it's important in many areas of life. So yeah. tell us, you know, what, well, first of all, what is the hero's journey's, you know, structure for those who aren't familiar with it and how does it relate to leadership? You know, thank you for asking that because, you know, it's one of the questions I don't get asked enough and I just love it. And like you, I'm a big fan of, of Joseph Campbell and, and and was part of, so interestingly, I was part of the men's movement in the 90s, which was the most washed out, useless bunch of stuff ever. <laughs> not because the content was terrible. The content was phenomenal. But men did not have the balls to actually take it on. Women took on the women's movement. It was amazing. Men did not. Men just went bought back into their nonsense. But when you look at great leaders, I mean, outstanding leadership, every one of them has done the hero's journey. And so in that, and I lay that out, as you said, in the book, in, the, in my book uh, called Fiercely Law, I actually give the structure so people can understand because that structure is the same structure we use for doing presentations. Mm. Following that, understanding this, the hero's journey is, at the outset, is somebody is normal, meaning you just, you know, you're doing your thing. You're, 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 you're Neo, um, who's Mr. Anderson working in the office, right? And, and all these great movies, as you know, are all based on this hero's journey. It's just the average guy. And something weird happens. Something like, I don't know, you might fall off a mountain because crazy people do that. I've heard. Uh, <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> totally, right? If, you know, you, or you get a horrible diagnosis or you, you know, or you go bankrupt. There's this moment of uh, awakening. And, and it's from that where we make the, the promise that things have got to change. Now, in, interestingly enough, and I speak about this too, that's actually not where things change. It's when we've normalized again and we can go back into the same old stuff again. But a, a hero says, you know what? I've had this awakening, and I promise things have changed, but I'm drifting back into the normal. Something else. There's some, I, I now have this awareness that there's something below the surface. And like I said, I talk to people about the soul of who they are, the soul of their business. It's not a religious statement. It's, it's, not a, it, it's even a spiritual statement. It's, it's this truth and essence about who you are. And then that drive to discover that and the drive to bring something to the world and so in that journey, as you move along that journey, you face ridicule, you face rejection. You think about Martin Luther King, you think about Gandhi, you think about all the massive rejection. And then there's another stage. And that next stage is where you face the pain. And then there's an imp a greater impetus to change. And then you take that journey into the change. But once you hit that, that's when you things seem much better. And so you go, oh, my goodness, this is so much better. I was over there. I was in pain. I was, you know, I was stuck first, and then I was in all the pain and the rejection. And over here, it's so much better. And people think that that's the end of the journey. <laughs> that is not the end of the journey. So the cycle is m much better. Once you've gone through the much better, you get to much worse. Because now I've got to take this message, this understanding, this wisdom I got from my journey, and I've got to bring it to the world where I'm going to, it's going to feel crushing. And you're going to have that moment going, I just can't do this anymore. I can't do it. It's much worse. 
But if you keep going through that journey, you get to the next stage, which is not much better, not much worse, but much different. It's a different world. So Neo is suddenly taken from the average world where everything's sort of normal, and then he sees inside of the, the, the matrix, you know, and, and he sees that he has to live in this shitty environment, eating this slop for food, and it's much, much worse. And then it's different because now he has the awareness that he can manipulate this, this entire world around making the difference that he wants to make. And then the last part of that journey is where it's much different, is the realization that what you went through is to make the difference, to be the leader. And leadership is not in the context of a CEO, although it could be. It's leadership. Are you a leader in your family? Are you a leader in your friendships? Are you a leader politically? Are you a leader in your community? What Leadership is actually always a personal hero's journey. And until we embrace that, and as, as Campbell said, how do you embrace it? As Campbell said, the treasure is in the darkest cave, the one you fear to step into. That's where it is. And, and it was illustrated beautifully for those of you who are Star Wars fans when Luke is with Yoda and he has to go into that dark cave, literally a dark cave. And he says, who am I going to find in there? Am I going to find Vader in there? Because he was afraid. And he says, you'll find your greatest enemy. And he battles what looks like Vader, and then he realizes it's himself. That is the journey. We don't look at ourselves. We're looking for external processes, and so we miss the journey. And it's so powerful in grounding us in what real leadership is. Tom, again, I, I feel like we're brothers from another mother because <laughs> this is the stuff that I love. In fact, I just a couple months ago, um, the former CEO of Campbell Soup, Doug Conant, uh, in his semi-retirement life, he's now uh, teaching leadership and uh, employee engagement, and he was offering a seminar right in my home city of Philadelphia. So in the spirit of lifelong learning, I go to the seminar, and it's this two-day you know, intense exploration where every person's supposed to come up with their own leadership model. So it's not him teaching his leadership model. It's helping us to determine our own. And not only does he ask you to, you know, do a lot of the things around values and what do you care about and all those things, but by the end of the two days, we all had to draw our leadership model, like make a picture of it. And so, you know, there was a pilot in there who drew kind of like an airplane and there was, a, it was a metaphor for lift and drag yeah. and all that. There was a, a, someone who loved gardening. And so the model was a garden and it was about planting seeds and nourishing. And, and I went in there with a blank slate. Part of it was just, Hey, you know, I'm, I geek out on leadership. What is this guy, you know, <laughs> talking about? And I walked out and my model was, was hero's journey. And it was the sort of the circular thing. And, and you just said, I mean, you know, when you see it, whether it's the Harry Potter stories, the, the star Wars stories, obviously matrix, I mean, it's these recurring themes. Why do these movies resonate? Because it's the story of our own personal life and our journey. And, 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 and I, again, you, you really moved me like uh, was saying, this isn't about being the CEO or having authority over people at work. It's, it's about life. And I say, look, leadership is influence. So you're a leader, whether you want to be or not, you know, you lead people with your words, but you also influence people when you choose to stay silent, you lead people by taking action or by choosing to be a bystander, you're influencing people no matter what you do. So how do you want to show up and lead today? Leadership's not a choice. Yeah, you know, it's interesting what you said because I think that this is something that people have got to grasp is leadership is personal, number one. But this hero's journey, we resonate with it. You know, like you said, we get pulled to the Star Wars, the, the Matrix, the Harry Potter, the movies, the, the books, the stories. But there's two pieces in this, and I think that people miss this. One is I watch those movies, read those books, because I can see myself. And I'm reminded that the journey's not over. That's number one. But there are other people who watch it, and they watch it because they want to be bystanders. Mm. So it becomes a passive. It becomes a, well, I'm, I'm living it vicariously through the Matrix, through Harry Potter. But they don't step into that. And the piece that I think is missed, um, which is, you know, one of the three C's that I speak about, which is uh, compassion, courage and curiosity mm. and, and and many people don't have the courage 
and they lack the curiosity. So they, though they, they, we're pulled, we were dynamically pulled towards the hero's journey, but we're not always got the, the curiosity of self and the courage to step into it. So many people are vicariously, oh yeah, I love the hero's journey. Yeah, but why don't you get on it? Right, right. Don't bitch, moan, and complain about your freaking job or your boss or, or your wife or your husband or your kids or your grandkids or, or whatever it is or the state of the government when you're not willing to step into that journey. This is The hero's journey is not passive. It's not there for you to watch. It's for you to step into. And so few of us do that. And that's why leadership is in a terrible state because we don't have the courage and the curiosity to have compassion. That's right. All right. One last question for you, Dob, because I can't let you go. Uh, part of your brand is full Monty leadership. We're talking about storytelling. Uh, you talk about a full Monty story. I'm assuming I don't take my clothes off and go tell stories to my team members. <laughs> you might. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be so, entertaining for everybody else. <laughs> so, so what does that mean to you? Well, full Monty. I mean, obviously, it's a metaphor, and it's a metaphor very simply. I mean, like in the movie Full Monty, you strip everything off and you reveal yourself. And this, in the movie, uh, the the guys take everything off because they're competing with strippers who are <laughs> much younger, much better looking, and obviously getting nowhere. And the only way they can draw a crowd is by taking everything off, including the things you can't. That is what leadership has to be today. It has to be that part of you that goes, I can't say that. That's the part that has to re be revealed. So I use the word soul. I got to tell you, that's a word that scares the shit out of me to use today still. Yeah. Because people go, oh, he's religious. Oh, it's fluffy. Oh, it's woo-woo. Well, guess what? I'm not religious, and I'm the least woo-woo guy you'll ever meet. But, it, but as I, my fear comes up around the context of these words. And so it's the same thing with you as you're listening to this, is when you're thinking about leading your team, when you, your people, your family, your community, whatever it is, what is it you fear to reveal? Because here's the deal. And there's a ton of research in the book to prove it including the Hawke effect, which talked about the, the Australian prime minister, understanding that what it is that you fear to reveal is what will endear your people to you. It, the thing you think will push them away will pull them to you. And, I, and I, I fully understand, I want you to get, I have deep compassion for you. I still choke on the word soul to this day, 30 odd years in, but I know it's the truth of the message that allows people to bond with me, allows them to get what it is that I'm saying. And that is what you need to do as a full Monty leader is reveal the thing you can't, reveal the thing they, those great authority figures told you you should never talk about. That's where you're going to endear people truly to you. I love that. And, and this brings me to our final question, which is, you know, I like to end uh, by taking all of this, but then boiling it down into something practical that the listeners can try today so they can go away and immediately take some kind of action to become a better leader to explore this what would you recommend they they try an exercise an experiment something like that let me give you a very simple powerful exercise that we do on the first day we're going okay and that is to go to your team go to your people and you can sit in a circle you can do whatever you want and, and do this a few times and and ask this question and you, you've, got, you've got to start. You've got to reveal first, right? So tell me something about yourself, superficial. So you want to, are you going to do the exercise with me, Kev? You want to do it right now? Yeah, let's do it. All right. I'm supposed to tell you something superficial. Superficial. Okay. Uh, I live uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Right. So I live in Vancouver. Now, if, normally the person who is in front would lead. So if you're the CEO – you would do it with somebody else. If you're the CFO is somebody under you, you would always lead. The person with the most authority always leads, not because you're the authority, but because you want to take the lead in vulnerability. So the first thing you do is, okay, superficial, good. So Philadelphia, Vancouver. Then you say, and by the way, it doesn't have to be equal. Then you say, um, here's something that um, I fear. Now it could be a physical phobia. It could be something, you know, whatever it is. Hey, I fear water snakes. That wasn't hard for me to come up with because I, I fear water snakes. Right. 
So I fear water snakes, okay? So for me, I was a multiple drawing, but I certainly fear heights. Mm, for good now. reason. <laughs> for good reason now. Okay, so we're a little bit deeper, right? So now the next one is, tell me something you wouldn't t normally tell somebody, particularly in an initial, initial meeting. Tell me something that you're kind of afraid to say. Hmm. So it's not a fear, it's a fear of revealing. See, I'm, I'm, I would have to think about this. See, one of, if you just said, tell me something that you wouldn't normally be sharing in initial meeting, I would go to something like one of my harder moments, like when my mom died when I was 15 or when a, a bill collector showed up when my dad went bankrupt and scared the hell out of me. Um, but, you know, it's, there's probably stuff deeper than that, but that's what comes to mind. Right. And, and that's great stuff. That's a great place to start. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you mine. Uh, for me, it's the, and I, and by the way, I want this fear. And I'll explain that in a moment, but that I will die a coward. Mm. That's a huge fear for me that they might say he was a coward. I keep that fear. Why? Because it keeps me on point to stay courageous. To make sure that doesn't happen, to use that fear as a motivator. Yeah. yeah. Fear is not a bad thing. You've just got to use it. Interesting. So be courageous all the time. Now, so if you do this, here's the question I ask people all the time. I know you've got this fear around vulnerability. We all do, particularly in leadership roles, because we're told it's bad. But a simple question, I ask it in the book. Simple question is this. If you think about two people that you've known the same amount of time, one is a good acquaintance, and the other one is a, somebody who is a fiercely loyal friend. What's the difference between the two? You've known them both the same amount of time. And you go, well, I invested more. But you did that because there's a friendship there. Why? What's the difference? Two decent people. Why did you? Is this one a good acquaintance? And this one is a good friend. And the answer is, you know their shit and they know yours. There's a revelation in the process. You want to bond your people to you? You have to reveal first. That exercise of stepping into the, the shallow end until we go to the deep end until we go, okay, here's the fear, but here's what I would not normally tell anybody. And we've had people break down and oh, cry. Yeah. The bond is phenomenal. And every single time, their level of engagement and commitment has gone through the roof. And that's just the first exercise we do. Yeah, Dob, this is crazy, crazy good stuff because it, it's so true. Like the, the people you feel closest with, you know, you think about like the old saying, like, you know, do you have a friend who, you, you know, who, who would bail you out of jail? Like, who's the person you'd call if you get you need to get bailed out of jail? And I think about the answer and the reason why I'm so close with this this person. I mean, it's the person I'm most vulnerable with. And I know he's been vulnerable with me. Like we know each other's failings and fears and stuff we're not so proud of or could get in trouble with. Well, you know, th those are our closest friends. And so by going vulnerable with people, it instills that level of trust and that mutual vulnerability. It's inevitable. Absolutely. And it brings us back to this, this piece in the hero's journey, because I know, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you, Kevin, do you read biographies of successful people? Sure. Of course you do. Everybody who's a leader has read biographies. We want to know. Right. And I said, so here's the simplicity. When you look at those biographies, many of them are four, five, six hundred pages. OK, now here's the thing. It, why do you read it? You go, this person is very successful. They're very famous. They, they did great things. Blah, blah. If that's the case and that's what you're reading the book for, the, the book would be somewhere between four and 20 pages. It's 600 pages. Why do you read it? Because you're drawn to the vulnerability. You're drawn to their heroic journey of the things they had to overcome. It's not about the success. The success is a result. It's not what actually matters. What matters is the 480 pages about that journey. And so, But we want to show up and say, here's my three pages of success. And we want to think people are going to bond to us because of that. No, they're not. Get with the program. Think about it. If the movie is just about, oh, well, the hero, here's the, here's the last scene. <laughs> well, where's the back? I don't understand. There's no backstory. I don't get it. 
Yeah, it's a good point. You, you wouldn't be considered a great leader if you just coasted all the way through. Great leaders are the ones who had to really persevere and overcome some stuff and figure it out, had tough times. And it's understanding that about there are many people who get to a leadership position who've not gone through that, who can't hold it. Right. Because nobody resonates with them. Nobody's bonded to them in any way. But the people who, who came up from the bottom or the people who, who have seen you struggle, who, you know, this in our world as speakers, we are glorified. And I always say this to people when I teach them speaking, I go, listen, let me just get rid of the glamour for you. <laughs> right? Because people have said to me, I can't believe that people pay you uh, tens of thousands of dollars to come, come and speak. And I go, nobody's ever paid me that. And they go, oh, so you discount? No, I never discount. They go, what do you mean? I go, they're paying me for the blood, sweat, and tears that I spent 30 years getting in order to bring that one hour. That's what they're paying me for. And, and, and if I just get up there and tell them the good stuff, nobody will listen to listen anyway. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Just that That's brilliant. heroic journey that we're pulled to. So, Dov, where can I send our listeners so they can learn more about you and your heroic journey and your books and programs <laughs> and other things? Um, please, if you want to find out more about me, of course, you can find me on all the usual social media places like Twitter, at the Dov Baron. You can find me on LinkedIn, on Facebook, Dov Baron Leadership. You can find me in a myriad of other places. Uh, the podcast is on iTunes, as, as Kevin mentioned. Uh, YouTube channel, Dove Baron, Full Monty Leadership, a uh, whole bunch of stuff on there. But my main site where you'll find out more about me and all of those other things is FullMontyLeadership.com. Full Monty, like the movie, FullMontyLeadership.com. And I'm going to put uh, in the show notes links to all of those places Dove just mentioned. All right, friends, you've just been mentored by the great, authentic Dov Barron. You can get links and notes from this interview and others over at leadx.org. You can get his book, Fiercely Loyal, and his other books from Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. And if you have questions for me or just want to suggest a guest or say hello, send me an email. I'm at kevin at leadx.org. Until next time, remember this quote from Eckhart Tolle, only the truth of who you are, if realized, will set you free. <laughs>